Yeah, hello everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to our session on ER applications. So we have an exciting program which is starting right now. Um, so we will have six different talks. Um, we will start with the first talk from um, John Nigel. So um, he's professor actually um, in, in UK. So also maybe a little bit about my background. So my background, I'm a research fellow or it's called research tutor at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, I just take on this position um, a short time ago um, and started this position last year. So I'm quite excited about the first talk we will st start right now. Um, the topic is an endoscope interface for immersive um, virtual reality applications. So let's have a look at this talk and let's start with the first talk. Hello. Well, first of all, I have to correct the chair that my name is Nigel John, not the other way around. Uh, everybody has that problem. Um, and it's great to be uh, coming to you from the UK. Um, maybe some of you came to VCBM in 2015, where it was at uh, the University of Chester. So, so this is uh, <laughs> great to bring Chester to VCBM once more. Now this is a short paper and it's, it's work in progress. So there's a lot more to do uh, on the project yet, uh, but I'm going to give you um, an update of where we are at the moment. And the title of the project is uh, an endoscope interface for immersive virtual reality. And as well as myself, uh, Tom Day from my group has been involved in this project and Terence Wardle is an, an experienced endoscopy surgeon from the Countess of Chester in the United Kingdom. So a little bit of background to start with, in case you are not familiar with uh, the endoscopy procedure. It's a procedure where an instrument called an endoscope, which consists of a very long, thin fiber optic bundle with a light and camera at one end, you can insert this into a patient and uh, start to see pictures from inside the body. So I've got a little image in the top right there, which shows an endoscope being used. And in this case, the endoscope is going in through the, uh, the patient's mouth and uh, into the esophagus and into the stomach. So somebody who does such a procedure has to learn how to control the endoscope and maneuver it to the position that they need to uh, either examine or even take um, some sort of procedure, like a biopsy. And they do that during their uh, residency as part of their uh, training. Uh, they might have a fellowship program. Now, during the training, they might practice on perhaps uh, animals or have access to specialist mannequins. And these all help uh, speed up the learning curve. I mean, there are simulators, commercial simulators as well, that exist for endoscopy procedures. And in the bottom right, I've got a picture of uh, such a simulator. This is one from a company called 3D Systems. It used to be called Symbionics. And they have a range of simulators. This particular one is called the GI Mentor. It's for gastronomic procedures. Now, these are good, and I think uh, they qualify to be called virtual reality simulators as well. And uh, you know, they, they are very effective at helping to train to do these procedures. The problem with them, I think, is, uh, is the cost. So the GI Mentor that you see in the picture you know, starts off at about $64,500, and you can pay as much as $114,000 if you have all the functionality that's available. So, so as a result, uh, these tend to only be available in the larger teaching hospitals or special training centers. So what we wanted to do in this project is really explore whether we can take advantage of the current generation of VR technology. And I mean the immersive VR headsets in, in, in this case, because they're really cheap these days. And so can we, create a solution to help train an endoscopy procedure you know, using the, these cheap off-the-shelf uh, 
hardware technology. So as I mentioned, it's a, it's a collaboration with the Countess of Chester Hospital in the UK. And uh, Terry Wardle, who, who I'm working with, now he, he's an expert in a particular type of procedure called ERCP. It's uh, when you do an endoscopy uh, into the pancreas or, or bile ducts. That's, that's the target that you're aiming for. And he invited us uh, into the uh, operating room and we observed uh, this procedure you know, being, being done on, uh, on real patients so we could carry out a task analysis. And the uh, picture you see on the left is a picture of the endoscope controller. For ERCP, it's called a duodenoscope. And uh, you can see that it has a couple of dials on it and those dials are used to control the orientation of the tip of the endoscope. The, the fiber optic wire goes through that controller and, and then in, into the patient. There's also an open channel on the uh, duodendoscope as well, which allows other instruments to be passed through into the patient and uh, allow you to do things like biopsies or inject uh, a contrast agent perhaps in, into the patient. So we wanted to try and emulate that using the latest VR hardware. And we decided to use the HTC Vive. Now, I think the Vive is quite a popular choice uh, in this session. I think a lot of the following uh, presentations are, are also using the HTC Vive. So picture of it there. The particular reason why we chose this, if you look at the hand controller, its shape is actually quite similar to what the uh, duodendoscope looked like on the previous slide. It's a very similar look and feel to it. So, so that was good. I mean, the alternative to the Vive, you know, the Oculus uh, products, they have this nice ergonomic hand controller, but it looks nothing like uh, the, the real endoscope controller. So, so, so that was one reason for our choice of the Vive. The other reason is that you can also use the Vive tracker. So that you see that on the left there. And that's a device that can be attached to other objects. And we can use the same Lighthouse track and emitter that comes with the Vive to track other objects as well as the headset and the hand controller. One question that one of the reviewers had for this paper was using um, the headset, you know, is the resolution um, and the field of view, are they problems for this procedure? Well, so far they haven't been. You know, we find that uh, you feel really immersed in a scene when you're wearing this headset and uh, you, you forget that you're not in the real world anymore. And resolution and field of view haven't been a problem, but it is an area that we will investigate as the project uh, continues. So that's the hardware. Um, for the software, I'm using Unity. Uh, we saw yesterday in the, uh, in the tutorial how a game engine like Unity or um, the Unreal game engine can really accelerate um, the development of applications. And so, yeah, so, so, so we're doing that as well. And uh, I'm using the Unity software to, uh, to create the, uh, the application. So that's the hardware and the software. Just going back to the hardware. Um, so I said the HC Vive controller was quite a similar look and feel to the endoscope controller. However, an important bit that was missing, if you remember the picture from a few slides ago, uh, it had these dials, which you could rotate to allow you to control the orientation of the endoscope, the tip of the endoscope. So we thought about that. Now, how, how could we emulate that on, on this hand controller, which has buttons you can press? So what we decided to do was use a different product. And you might be familiar with the Microsoft Surface dial. It, it is, as the name suggests, a dial, a, a knob that you can turn and rotate. And uh, we used uh, heavy duty Velcro to um, attach a Microsoft Surface dial to the end of the controller to give us that functionality of something I can rotate to control the tip of the endoscope. The clinician will also be inserting the endoscope into the patient. So we needed to track the insertion of something uh, to, to emulate that. 
and uh, I spent a few hours in my garage and I built um, a, a holder for the, uh, the Vive controller and uh, drilled a hole in the holder so that a rod would pass through it and then movement of that rod with a Vive tracker attached to one end will give us the information about how far the endoscope optical bundle is inserted into our virtual patient. So that's our uh, hardware interface. And I've got a couple of video clips to, to show you it being used. I'll start with the uh, video clip on the top left. If I start that playing, you can see that the dial has been rotated. Now there are two dials on the actual Duo endoscope. And uh, we've only got one dial with the Microsoft dial device. But if you notice that you could press down on the dial device. So we use that action to uh, switch between the inner and the outer dial of the uh, of the actual endoscope. And uh, in the other video, let's play that. You can see I've got my rod with the Vive tracker on it, and we can know the amount or the distance of insertion. Here it's just moving out one rod, but in the virtual scene, it's inserting the endoscope into the patient. So this is what you see when you're wearing the headset. We've got a, a virtual patient. We've rigged the patient and put it into the correct orientation. And as I'm inserting my wooden rod in real life, in the virtual world, the endoscope is going into the patient. And there's a monitor there to show you the, uh, the view from the endoscope camera uh, as the uh, endoscope is moving inside. And you can see a, a still of it on the, on the right in this picture as well. I'll just say a little bit more about uh, how we achieved the endoscope rendering. And uh, again, uh, the picture on the right is actually a video, which I'll just start playing. So the push forward, pull back of the endoscope, we get that information from the Vive tracker. Then you'll see that uh, the camera is changing orientation. So, so in real life, we're changing the dial, the Microsoft dial to, uh, to get that effect. Now um, you can inflate the organ that you're in as well. And so we're doing some scaling of the mesh to, uh, to represent uh, the inflation effect as well. Now the camera is now inside the mesh as well. Uh, so we had to do a little bit of pre-processing with our mesh models because on your typical mesh model, the surface normals are pointing outwards. But this time we're inside the mesh so we needed the normals to point inwards so that the, the rendering equation would perform correctly. So I used um, the Mesh Lab software to invert all the normals before we imported the, the models into, into Unity. Uh, texture map I was used to get the, the colors you see here. And the camera, the endoscope camera, is a, it's a, it's a separate uh, Unity camera. And at, at the same location, we had to uh, put a high intensity point point light source and does disable the shadow effects as well. Uh, and that actually replicates the view that you get from a real endoscope quite well. So I'm just about to, uh, or slightly over my 10 minutes, so I'd better sum up. Um, as I say, it's work in progress and we still got a big list of things to do as we develop this project. So some of the things that we'll be working on uh, are on this slide. It has all been slowed down because of the COVID problem and my lab was inaccessible for several months. So um, I'd hope to be further along the development path than we actually are. And uh, things we have to do is uh, move from the esophagus into the stomach and then into the pancreas. You know, some more fine tuning of the endoscope controller and then introduce some of the other tools that you can do in this procedure to, for, for example, inject contrast agent and other therapeutic procedures. So the endoscope uh, surgeon that we're working with has given us very positive feedback uh, on uh, what we've done so far, but we need to do a, a, a full validation study at the hospital. Uh, and that's gonna be the next main stage of this project. So I better stop there because my time is, I think I've got slightly over time and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks a lot, Nigel. Very interesting talk. Um, we, we have here one question um, and the question comes from Nueska Smith. I really like the Microsoft Service Dial addition to the wife set. Is there any opportunity to talk to the hardware producers to get custom hardware for such 
surgical training scenarios or is the solution already sufficient as it is? Yeah, I mean, that would be an ideal solution would be to get a custom bit of hardware built. But at the outset of this project was, you know, can we do it with commercially available off the shelf hardware that that's, uh, doesn't cost very much money? And, uh, and the Surface Dial and the, and the HTC Vive are really affordable devices. So, so that, that's the route we've chosen to go. Though I, I totally agree that uh, getting custom hardware built and if it could be manufactured in enough quantity, then that, that would be a, a good alternative. But, but for now, we stick into these off-the-shelf uh, affordable hardware products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> makes sense. Um, I don't see a second question, so I just already, um, yeah. Uh, yes, somebody seems to be typing. One more question maybe from my side. So you were talking about um, your collaboration partner who was a specialist. Uh, so I'm quite curious. So did you talk only to your uh, single collaboration partner or did you have collaborations with a couple of people who already tested your, um, your software and your hardware setup? I mean, right now I'm using the, uh, the local expertise and the, the local mm -hmm. Chester Hospital and uh, we haven't gone wider than that yet. Uh, and uh, yeah, but uh, as we start doing the validation uh, study, we would want to get more experts from different hospitals around the UK and even beyond uh, involved as well. But, but right now this work has, has just been done with the, the local expert in Chester. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Just look at this. Uh -huh. Here's one more question. What are the main drawbacks? Um, oh, the question changed. What do you, the surgeons, consider the <laughs> what do you, the surgeons, consider the main drawbacks when using your solution versus the expensive GI mentors? Yeah, well, well I think uh, the the GI mentor, for example, you know, you're using the real endoscope uh, interface or what what looks and feels like the real endoscope interface, and so it's, it's definitely a higher fidelity solution. Uh, this is a lower fidelity solution, and uh, but because you're immersed in the scene, you don't you don't get that with the GI mentor. You, you don't feel that you're in the operating theatre with a, with a real patient. You know, you know that you're standing in front of this this simulator. And so our goal is to try and make the things that you are holding and feeling in your hands feel feel like the the real tools. And uh, so far, it looks promising that that would, that that we're doing that. But I say you know we've got a lot more work to do yet before we we satisfied with the solution. Mm. Yeah, but but yeah, it, it looks very exciting. So I wish you good luck with the future development, Nigel. So thanks okay, a lot thanks. for your talk. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'll uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Good. Yeah. So Oscar, can you please take over? So yes. maybe, meanwhile, um, Oscar is an associate professor in at a university in Barcelona in the Information and Communication Technologies Department. So his talk now will be on VRIDAA, Virtual Reality Platform for Training and Planning in Implementations, uh, sorry, Implantations of Occluder Devices in Left Aerial uh, Appendages. Can you see the full screen? Yeah, I can see it. Good. Uh, Please start. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. So uh, welcome uh, from Barcelona. Uh, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and, and in fact, this talk, it, it has several similarities with the previous one in, in terms of how to develop and to explore the capabilities of, of virtual reality technologies for training of some, some uh, medical interventions, but also in this case for planning and, and in particular for some particular medical device like our, the left atrial uh, appendage occluder devices. Uh, so let me see if I can, okay. Um, so uh, atrial fibrillation is kind of an abnormal cardiac uh, arrhythmia and it induces some uh, irregular heart beating of the atrial chambers and, and this can be a problem for several reasons and, and one is that it can induce the uh, generation of thrombus in the left atria that then can go up to the brain and induce uh, ictus and, and and be a major problem, uh, a stroke uh, problems. Uh, one, uh, one thing very uh, interesting uh, in, in the left atria and, and related to the blood flow uh, in, in this uh, cardiac structure is that thrombus formation 
it's almost always happened in one uh, appendix uh, of the of the left atria that is called the left atrial appendage and and it's very interesting because it has a different shape depending on on different people and and in fact uh, clinicians have had a lot of fun trying to find categories of this shape, uh, really qualitative categories, but they are using uh, this just to refer to a certain type of morphology like chicken wing, LAAs, or wind socks, or cauliflowers, or, or cactus. So obviously no one wants to have a thrombus in the left atria and have a risk of, of having a stroke. So uh, for most patients, they give anticoagulants, but a lot of patients can have contraindications. Uh, so uh, for the patients with contraindications, uh, they are implanted uh, an occluder device, uh, an AAO, uh, and you can see here in, in this video how uh, this uh, device is inserted into the left atria and then is implanted just uh, in the interface with the left atrial appendage in order to prevent the blood going into the left atrial appendage and generate thrombus formation. Obviously, uh, as the shapes are different from every uh, person, so it's very important to determine where to implant and the size of the device, of the implanted uh, device. Clinicians, what they do, basically interventional cardiologists, what they do is just to try to measure, uh, uh, in, to have some morphological indices uh, to guess which is the optimal uh, device uh, setting and uh, configuration for a given person, so personalized the device, uh, uh, the device settings. Um, usually they use kind of relatively low resolution imaging like uh, echocardiography or x-rays during the intervention. In some uh, specialized centers, they can even have higher resolution images like CT, uh, but it's still the decision on which uh, uh, device to implant because there are different possibilities from different uh, uh, commercial uh, available devices. Uh, it depends a lot on the clinician's criteria and the clinician experience and the type of medical image analyzed. The problem is that if uh, the device implanted is wrong or is not optimal, it can have an incomplete closure of the left atrial appendage uh, and the device can just what it said, embolize, so go out and, and this is very risky. Or it can even generate thrombus formation again outside the device, which, which is quite undesirable. So uh, over the last, let's say, three, five years, there has been uh, several engineers, uh, biomedical engineers, uh, working with clinicians to try to use computational tools for helping on the planning of these uh, uh, interventions. And, and like, for instance, 3D printing. Uh, but obviously, 3D printing, uh, we know that it has some drawbacks. Uh, I mean, the good thing is that you can really plan before the intervention with pa from patient-specific models that you can print. Uh, but to have realistic materials that mimic the, 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 the interaction with the actual wall is not easy. It can be a bit slow uh, to print depending on the medical service and depending on the material, it can be costly. Um, so, I mean, this is something that to be uh, considered. Uh, and also there are some uh, uh, companies that have developed some visualization platforms. Uh, obviously uh, all of them visualize in 2D flat screens, but you can have um, the, the uh, medical images like the tag visualize, make manual annotations, uh, have a, a 3D surface mesh or, or the volume rendering visualize like this one from Trimensio or even Feops, the Feops company that just does some simulations on, on, on how the implant is going to be end up. Uh, ourselves, we develop also together with clinicians VIDA, that is a, a platform on a web-based uh, interface where the clinician can explore uh, the anatomy, the 3D anatomy and, and implant virtually some devices and, and, and get some um, measurements there. But obviously all this is on 2D flat screens. And the main objective of, of all this work, that again, this is a short paper, it's, it's an ongoing work and, and a lot of things to, to be done yet, it's just to, to try to explore the possibilities of, of a virtual reality environment on, on this application uh, in order to see if we can have better depth uh, perception, better perception of a scaling of the anatomy, to understand better the anatomy 
and, and the relation with, with the devices. And, and also to have feedback from the users, clinicians on, on, the, on the platform. Um, and, and in two kind of use cases, huh? as the previous talk, as a training tool for trainees, uh, this is quite interesting for medical schools uh, even, uh, but also as a preparative tool, uh, uh, as a tool that the clinician is using in order to decide which is the most optimal uh, device to, to be implanted. So this is a, a short video uh, of, of the current setup of the, of the platform uh, where, let me, it's a bit too quick, but we can see here that we can, the, the, the user can see the 3D geometry together with some important landmarks for the intervention and the center line uh, because it helps to decide which uh, device to be implanted. We can see also in the background, the medical images, different slices of the medical image and the left atrial appendix segmented. Uh, for the clinicians that are more used to this type of visualization. We have the menus here and there. We have some graphs where we can visualize uh, the evolution along the geometry of some diameters, because this is again, a very important and relevant information to decide the device. And it's just on one side. Uh, we have implemented different options of clipping, of transparency to really browse within the, the anatomy, and we can have different type of devices with different sizes uh, browse along the geometry uh, with uh, where it can just, uh, the user can just play, uh, play around. We also have a similar point of view as the previous talk, this endoscopy uh, view uh, that you can see here, because um, for some parts of the intervention that the clinician need to make a hole between the, the two atria, and this is very important for the approach to the left uh, atrial appendage. The endoscopic view is something that they don't have with the current visualizations, and this is something quite uh, appreciated. Um, so I think the video, that's all. And, and in fact, we've seen in some cases very interesting things that trying with different devices uh, in the virtual reality uh, uh, environment, it's very easy to find where the left atrial appendage is not fully covered, that you have some holes in here. So if you have a hole here, then blood flow can enter, can still enter into the left atrial appendage and it will generate a recirculation of blood flow, a vortices that this is not ideal. And on the other hand, with a different uh, device, this wasn't a, a problem. So this kind of tests are important just to have an idea on the optimal device for a given patient. Um, so we tested of six different uh, left atrial uh, geometries and, and we prepared a questionnaire uh, that uh, we brought to uh, interventional cardiology experts. They are worldwide experts on this type of interventions, luckily in Barcelona. They didn't have previous experience on VR. They came to the university and they tested uh, the, inter the, the, the environment in these different uh, cases. So the feedback we got, it was quite interesting. They, they really see very positive uh, 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 outcomes of, of this technology, uh, both as a preoperative tool and as a training tool. Uh, there are some things in the navigation menu and, and also in terms of the realism of the deployment of the device that needed to be improved. Also at some point one was having kind of a bit of blurriness, that's why the ease of use was a bit down, but these are things in, in progress. And currently we are doing a very interesting study with, uh, with uh, clinicians where we are comparing not just virtual reality, but also with the web-based version and compared to the 3D printing and to CFD simulations uh, as ways to try to optimize uh, or to give information for the planning of these interventions. Again, this is very preliminary results, but we, even with the current, uh, uh, just proof of concept uh, virtual reality environment. We have some results uh, quite similar to the web-based version uh, and the 3D printing for the planning, but for the technology to be used and translated into the hospital, uh, still we need to do a lot of work. 3D printing is something that already can be done in the hospital, so this is still things with, that we need to improve. So just as conclusion, uh, VR is seen as a very nice source of motivation uh, and to better understand the anatomy and, and just complete uh, everything that is needed for this. The endoscopy feature is something quite new and interesting. And we need to work on this device deployment 
uh, to try with other cheaper uh, uh, headsets like Oculus, try to also visualize blood flow simulations. And, and I think the next talk is super relevant for this. Uh, it's really related and just explore other things like AR uh, and, and having a, a more thorough evaluation and study. So, well, these are the people involved uh, in, in, in this super nice project and, and thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks a lot Oscar, for, for your talk. <laughs> um, please, um, if you have any questions, I think there are questions just coming in, just put them into the Discord channel. So if you go to the website, there's a link to the Discord channel so you can log in there and post them there. So one, one question from my side, um, Oscar, so you were, um, a problem which we are also often having is how can what is a good way to operate with this um, 3D menus? Because you need you, you showed a number of screenshot uh, shots where you could see um, that you need a number of options which um, the user can select. Actually, do you only use it, or also are your your users using this 3D menus? And how good is it working for them? Well, no, the the, the menus. Uh, what they well, it was a, a first uh, kind of prototype. And they needed some minutes, let's say five, 10 minutes to really understand the controller, uh, et cetera. It was something totally new for them, uh, VR. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some things, I mean, they are clinicians. They like to just change things and adapt things to exactly what they want. But in the end, it wasn't such a big deal, uh, the, the, um, the navigation menu. We need to improve the linking of, of the different uh, references space, so the 3D, uh, visualization is linked with the medical images that would be quite mm -hmm. uh, useful but the main drawback was the realism of the device deployment in the mm -hmm. end in the first video i've shown it's just like it's something that is within a tube a catheter and then it's deployed and obviously uh, we didn't uh, do it yet uh, but this needs substantial computational resources in terms of graphics because we are talking about something that is expanding and it needs to interact with the wall. Mm -hmm. To do this realistically, it will be challenging. And, and I don't know, uh, I mean, probably going uh, far from clinical translation. So we need to see the trade-off on what it could be feasible to have in a computer in the hospital for them to use mm -hmm. or other things that are super nice and cool, but needs computational infrastructure for it. Mm. So, so for, for the computation infrastructure, did you use at the moment just a kind of a strong uh, laptop with no, a computer, a good computer, a good yeah. GPU, uh, and well, it was the HTC uh, uh, Vive mm -hmm. Pro, uh, yeah. but did something that with Oculus we want to have a go with a regular laptop to see, because the, the the thing is in a hospital you will have certain constraints in terms of a space. Yeah, it would be yeah. difficult to find a room just to uh, stand up, etc. If we manage to have something that can be just sitting uh, in front of a laptop, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I, I don't see a new question. There are just two people who say it's really a great approach and they're looking forward to the results which are coming soon. Thank so you. thanks a lot for your talk. You. And let's continue with the next one. Mm -mm -mm. Hello. Can you see and Timio? By Benjamin. So the next talk is actually by Benjamin Barrett. And it's quite interesting because we will have now four talks in a row, which are taken over by the University of Magdeburg. So yeah, we are looking forward to this talk. So yeah, Benjamin, you will actually have the first talk. So looking forward to this. OK, thank you very much. Um, well. My topic is the virtual reality flow lens for blood flow exploration. So uh, let me just give you a very quick overview of this uh, general topic. Uh, so when I'm talking about exploring blood flow visualizations, what we are actually doing is we are working with simulated uh, patient specific uh, blood flow data, um, which is interesting for medical research uh, in order to yeah, understand the formation and development of various pathologies, for example, aneurysms. And in this specific case, it is usually very interesting to see the relation between morphologic changes on the vessel wall and uh, the underlying blood flow. So the data we have usually consists of a static vessel surface with uh, various parameters, 
uh, and path lines to represent the blood flow also with various parameters. So for the vessel surfaces, typical parameters would be the blood pressure or wall shear stress. And for the path lines, we would have um, parameters such as the flow velocity or distance to surface. Sometimes we also have additional objects like stents or coils um, if they exist in the patient. And if we try to visualize uh, this type of data, we will end up with a problem almost immediately. Uh, namely that we are trying to visualize a complex three-dimensional shape of the vessel on a normal two-dimensional screen. You can see an example of this here on the right. So by just looking at a two-dimensional projection of this very complex vascular structure, it is very difficult to really understand or get a feeling for uh, well, the shape of, of this very complex uh, vascular structure. And of course, we're also dealing with a lot of overlaps at nested features, obviously. Um, the vessel surfaces is overlapping with the path lines, but also within the path lines, there are often interesting structures such as vortices, uh, which also may be yeah, hidden by more laminar flow. So of course, uh, since this is quite a common problem, there are various uh, typical solutions uh, one could take to tackle these problems. Um, for the problem with our two-dimensional screen, well, an obvious solution would be to, well, not use a normal two-dimensional screen, but instead use a virtual reality headset, which is capable of producing three-dimensional images. So now it would be easier to understand the shape of uh, complex objects. And in order to solve problems like overlaps, um, one obvious solution would be to use filtering, meaning that the user defines what kind of feature he or she is interested in, and then the visualization cuts basically everything away that is not yeah, necessary to see that. Oh, and if we highlight these two points, uh, we basically have a very good description of uh, what we were actually trying to do. Uh, we want to do uh, filtering of blood flow data in virtual reality. Our work is inspired by the so-called flow lens by Rocco Gasteiger and colleagues. Uh, basically, this is a technique to blend two different visualizations using a magic lens. Um, you can see an example here on the right. So we have two visualizations. In one visualization, I've just displayed all of the path lines in our data set. And in the second one, I've highlighted a vortex structure. And then I can use this circular lens, basically move it uh, over my visualization at the location that I find interesting and blend between the different uh, visualizations. Uh, a big advantage of this method is that I'm not using a global filtering, so I'm only filtering in the region that is interesting, meaning that uh, context information can be kept. So it's not just removing everything, and instead uh, it's giving me an option to choose what I want to re uh, remove and where I want to remove it. Obviously, as this is a technique that works in screen space, it can't be easily translated to virtual reality. So we just we can't just say we take this and make it 3D and then it will work. So uh, of course we had to do some adjustments. The basic setup is uh, quite simple. Um, we chose to use a VR headset and motion controllers. Once again, the HTC Vive, which seems to be quite popular uh, in this round. Um, so generally our vessel with the inset path lines, which is our target object, uh, is placed in the scene and it can be easily and freely moved using the motion controller. Um, so you just have um, a laser pointer that shoots out of the controller. And with this pointer, you can grab the object and move it around. And if you take a second controller, you can do a pinch gesture, uh, which will allow a scaling of the object. Our lenses are no longer two-dimensional. They are also uh, two-dimensional objects in our implementation. Uh, they can be moved uh, similarly uh, to the vessels, so I can move them, I can scale them, uh, and I can also attach them to a vessel. So if they are attached, they basically stay with the vessel, and if I move the vessel, the lens will move accordingly. Now what the lens does, it is it applies a filtering uh, to uh, the intersecting geometry, so I basically move the lens over something in my visualization, or I move 
that so so that uh, the object is covered from the lens, and then within the lens a filtering is applied. Uh, of course, in order to configure the filtering, we also need a user interface, which we have. Uh, it's connected to the controller in our case, so the user can bring it up at any time if he needs to change uh, some settings. And since it's always uh, attached to the controller, uh, we can make sure that it's always available for the user. Let me quickly give you an overview of the filtering concept. Um, so let's assume this uh, very beautiful object is an object that we want to filter. So it's our target object. It has uh, parameters mapped to it. Uh, in this case, it's a par uh, parameter that goes from zero to one as represented by a color scale. And now I want to apply some filtering to this object. So I can place my lens, which in this example, of course, is also two dimensional. Uh, whereas in the real implementation, all of these objects would be three dimensional. Um, and I define a filter for my lens and to all the regions that are within the lens, the filter will be applied. So in this example, I want to keep the areas with a well, uh, value range between one and 0 0.5 uh, and everything else will be cut out. I can also combine multiple filters uh, by using either multiple filters on a single lens or using multiple lenses. So when I have multiple lenses in my visualization uh, and they intersect, we will basically model an OR relation uh, between their filters. So uh, only regions will be removed where uh, all of the filters basically vote for uh, the region to be removed. Whereas if I apply uh, multiple filters to the same lens object, we will uh, model an AND relationship where all regions will be removed uh, where at least one of the associated filters asks for the region to be removed. So now we've talked about this uh, quite a bit in concept. I think it's time that we see a live demonstration. So I've prepared a video right here. Um, so if I stop it for a moment, you can see I've just uh, selected one of my lens objects. In this case, it is a sphere. So it's always uh, visualized semi-transparently. Uh, at the moment, uh, it basically does nothing because it has no filter attached. So I will bring up my user interface and create a filter to attach to the lens. I first select a attribute. And then I need to select the range of values that is interesting to me. So these are the values that will be kept. And when I move it into my uh, data set, you can see it applies the filtering uh, to its own volume. Of course, I can uh, adjust the filter and the visualization will change accordingly, as you can see here. Uh, for this value range selection, uh, we decided to use the uh, touchpad of the controller. You will be able to see that in a second. So as you can see here, uh, if I move my finger over the touchpad in a horizontal direction, I am moving uh, this selection. Uh, left to right. And if I move my finger up and down, I change uh, the width of the selection. Uh, and by doing so, I can quite easily uh, define a value range that is interesting to me. Okay. Oh, don't want to start it again. <laughs> uh, to summarize, we've built a prototype that allows dynamic filtering of simulated blood flow data in VR. Uh, of course, we used uh, blood flow data as an example. This technique can be uh, applied to other types of data, of course. Basically, all we need is some sort of objects, surfaces, or pipelines which have parameters attached to them, which we can use for filtering. And then this approach would basically work out of the box. Um, of course, what we still need to do is we need to tailor this application to more specific application scenarios. Basically, it's like a toy box at the moment. Uh, and in order to make it more useful, we would have to tailor it to a specific application scenario, for example, medical education or treatment planning or something like this. And of course, what we also need to do is incorporate the time varying aspect of the data. I said that in the beginning, for example, the path lines are time dependent, but in our current prototype, they are basically static. So they uh, never change and can't move. And of course, this is not ideal for, for blood flow data, but a pro uh, problem with that is that it also increases the uh, interaction complexity. So 
there's still a lot to be done. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Benjamin. Uh, looks very interesting. So that's part of your PhD thesis this work. Yes, it's a late edition, but uh, it is. OK, <laughs> very good. Um, so I have here two quick questions, which I can combine to one. Um, so Nigel um, was saying, great visualizations. How do you calculate the blood flow simulation? Is it all pre-computed, or could it be done in real time? And Oscar actually had more or less the same question. So basically, is it dynamic, or is it static? Yes, uh, it's pre-computed, so we don't have an option to seed new lines at the moment. Uh, the problem with that is, of course, uh, integrating new path lines is quite computational uh, intensive. And since we are in a VR application, uh, the frame rate is quite crucial. So what we can't have is the application freezing for a couple of seconds in order mm -hmm. to calculate new path lines. Of course, this uh, could, in theory, be done if you were to unload it to a different thread, for example, use multi-threading. This is in theory possible, but uh, for our prototype, we wanted to focus on the interaction. So we're using pre-integrated uh, path lines. Mm. Mm. So you, um, you, you showed um, a number of quite interesting navigation approaches. So did you, at the moment, only your team use it? Or did you also make a very early initial evaluation with uh, some external people? using it like with doctors or? Yes, uh, we did use uh, do some very early informal uh, evaluations. Basically, we've shown it uh, to a few people and asked mm -hmm. for their feedback. Uh, they all found it quite useful. But of course, a problem is that, uh, as I've said, the prototype is quite generic at the moment. So it's not tailored to a specific application scenario. Uh, so for example, we had a, a person there who said it would be great for education for example, uh, for uh, fluid dynamic simulations to basically show students how fluid dynamic simulations work, how the flow reacts, for example, to certain obstacles. But in order to do that, uh, we would, for example, need the ability to uh, have preset scenarios. So basically that the student uh, puts on the headset and everything is pre-configured, a profile is loaded, mm -hmm. uh, and the list of interaction is limited. And of course, so these are, are the things that would need to be done. Mm. Yeah, it, it would be, of course, quite complex to do a good evaluation here. Yeah. So thank, our time is over. So thanks a lot for your talk. It was very interesting. Benjamin. Thank you. Um, so we are continuing now with Patrick Saalfeld. He will be the next in the line. And he's also from the University of Magdeburg. This um, topic will be learning hand anatomy with sense of embodiment. So he's actually postdoc. So Patrick, are you already there? I'm here, but um, I'm not allowed to share my video at the moment. Ah, OK. Um, yeah, let's just. Ah. Oh, no, no, it works. Okay. Nice background. Um, Great, so you are ready to start. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, today I will talk about um, our VR application that supports anatomy students to learn about um, hand anatomy. Um, and um, first, yeah, I first talk about why we choose the hand as our education scenario. So um, yeah, the hand, the human hand has a high density of different structures. So a lot of bones, joints, muscles. And um, for medical students, it's very challenging to um, learn about the morphology of these structures and um, also about the spatial relations of these structures. And uh, here, um, an interactive 3D visualization could help. And that was the reason that uh, we um, try to do this in VR. And um, we try to combine an immersive VR environment with um, embodied learning. And embodied learning means that you use body activity, so movement of your body. And um, this could help, or this can be a catal catalyst um, for generating learning. So in the end, it could support the learning process. And that's what we have in mind with this application. So I will present this VR prototype that supports um, sense of embodiment. Um, yeah, first we, we um, acquired some requirements. This was done together with a, with a professional anatomy educator with 12 years of um, professional experience. 
Um, additionally to that, we um, studied some learning materials, so um, textbooks and um, anatomy atlases. And this leads to four requirements that we um, acquired for this application. The first one is that um, the model has to be complete, of course, the hand model. The second requirement is that um, our virtual hands that we see in our VR application should mirror the physical hand posture of the user. The third requirement is that um, it should be possible to have uh, an overview of over all structures, but also to select only single anatomical systems. So for example, if the user just wants to see his or her bones, then it should be possible to um, hide all other structures. And the um, last requirement is that the VR environment should be easy to set up and should be affordable. Yeah, so um, regarding the first requirement, um, we needed a 3D hand model and um, we checked the, the anatomy atlas from Netter. And if you um, look there, then you find, there you find 129 structures that uh, um, poor <laughs> medical students have to learn. And um, yeah, there are 29 bones, 29 muscles, and so on. You can see that listed here. So there's quite a lot to learn for the students. And um, yeah, we checked commercial models and free models. And luckily we found um, this 3D model that was free on Sketchfab. And um, yeah, this model is, um, um, has different anatomical regions. It has a very high resolution. And additionally to that, it has um, textures applied on the on the model already. So um, textures are especially important for the muscles. You can see that on the second image. And um, with this texture, you can see the direction that the muscles um, take. So that's quite important for learning. Um, yeah, that's a hand model. And of course, we want to animate this hand model to have it um, animated in our VR environment. And for that, we used um, skeletal animation that's a combination of rigging and skinning. So um, rigging means that you create a, an invisible skeleton inside your 3D model. And skinning means that you um, apply each vertex to one of the bones of this invisible skeleton. And to create this invisible skeleton, this was uh, straightforward and easy because we already had the real bones of the model and we could use that um, as our invisible skeleton. Oh, sorry, I forgot the videos. Um, here you can see how the hands are animated. Yeah, here on the left are bones, um, arteries, and vessels and nerves. Here in the video in the center, you only see um, vessels and nerves. And on the right side, you can see the animated movement of um, muscles and ligaments. Um, so the next thing is that we want to induce the sense of embodiment, so the feeling that uh, these hands are yours. And um, sense of embodiment has three subcategories. The first one is sense of self-location, the second is um, sense of body ownership, and the third one is sense of agency. And um, so our first decision was that the user sees um, the hands from an ego perspective. So um, that increases the sense of self-location. So if the hands are in front of you, you feel that you are the avatar that um, has these hands. hands. Um, then, of course, we, um, we mimic the position and orientation of the real hands and, put, um, and map them to the virtual hands. That increases the feeling of body ownership. So you think that um, these are your hands. And finally, we um, map the hand posture. So if you have different postures with your hands, we map this onto the virtual hands. And this gives, um, if you make, uh, if you move your hands and um, the virtual hands follow that movement, this gives you an impression of control, that you have control over these hands. And this increases the sense of agency. Yeah. So um, now we have virtual hands that do the same as your real hands, which, um, which helps, but um, this has one drawback. Um, the hands are very small. So with the current VR headset, the resolution is not so high. And if you want to explore or inspect details of these virtual hands, it's not so easy. And that is the reason we also put um, very large copies of hands in the virtual environment. You can see this here. And um, these large copies can have three different states. 
one is open, one is closed, and the third state is mimicry. And I show a small video. So you can um, choose one of these states with this menu on the right side. And um, yeah, after you um, um, press one of these buttons, the hands um, takes the new states. So open, closed, or the third state is um, mimicry, which means that the large hands do the same as your small hands, but they always are upright and have the same orientation. Only the orientation and position of the fingers change. Yeah. Then um, according to requirement three, it should be possible to show and hide um, anatomical systems. Um, yeah, that's an, is an essential part of um, systemic anatomy education. And um, yeah, this also allows to investigate structures that would be occluded otherwise. And um, you can see this in this short video. So there's this um, panel that follows you everywhere in the VR environment and you can just press buttons. And um, after pressing a button, you either um, hide or show the associated um, um, anatomical system. Yeah. So as a VR headset, we used the Oculus Quest so initially we started with the HTC Vive, but we um, later decided for the Oculus Quest because um, it's very affordable, or at least it was affordable, because currently you can't buy it anymore. And um, yeah, it looks like that you will never be able to buy it, at least in Ger Germany anymore. But it costs around uh, 400 euros, so it was very cheap. And there's almost no technical setup involved. So you don't need to set up um, trackers or lighthouses somewhere. It does everything by inside out tracking and you can just um, um, yeah, um, put it out somewhere and just give it to someone and it just works. So that's great about this headset. And uh, the reason we switched from the HTC Vive to the Oculus Quest was the final reason was that it has integrated hand tracking. So if you put away the controllers of the headset, you get um, very accurate um, finger tracking and hand tracking, which is really nice. Um, yeah. Okay, so we had an evaluation with our tool. So um, we asked seven users, seven users, um, they all had a different background. Everyone um, was non-medical, so we had no medical students for our study. And the procedure was as follows. So we started with a short introduction, then we explained the prototype, and um, yeah, we let the users and participants test everything and played around with everything. And after that, um, we handed out three, handed out three questionnaires regarding usability, presence, and sense of embodiment. And the results um, of these questionnaires, um, you can see them here. So regarding usability, we use the system usability scale from Brook. Um, here we got um, 85 from 100 points, which um, yeah, is according to the paper is very good regarding usability. Um, the presence you can see on this um, um, graphic on the right side. Um, so presence is a subjective feeling of being there. So quite important for our tool. Um, here we use the iGroup presence questionnaire with a scale from minus three to three. And um, yeah, the physical presence was rated highest, which was quite good for us. Um, the degree of realism was um, rated worst. And uh, there are two reasons for that. One obvious reason is that um, if you have skeletal hands, that's not really realistic. So it doesn't look like your real hands, of course. Um, but the other reason was that um, the movement of the muscles was not um, physically correct, but just, um, yeah, we just interpolated the muscle mesh between different states. And sometimes um, there were artifacts in the mesh. And this could also be a reason for this low weighting. Um, and regarding the last category, sense of embodiment, um, we selected questions from, from a questionnaire from Gonzalez, Franco, and Peck. Here was the scale was from 0 to 2.5. And um, yeah, these were all weighted um, very good. OK, to summarize, um, I presented a VR-based prototype that um, supports students in learning head anatomy. And it is designed to induce sense of embodiment. And for future work, of course, we need to um, do a user study with medical students in a real medical context. Um, 
then we want to include uh, clipping planes and magic lenses because currently you can just hide and show complete anatomical systems, but we want to um, allow for a focus and context visualization. So you just have a magic lens and inside this lens, you only see the bones. This would be something that is interesting. And one last extension that I think could be interesting or maybe it's totally um, strange, but I would uh, like to test this approach with uh, foot anatomy. So uh, feet and hands are very similar from a, from a structure perspective. So it should be possible to control the movements of your feet with um, hand tracking. And um, of course you lose a bit of the sense of embodiment, but maybe this is uh, interesting for learning. So yeah, that's it for me. Thanks for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So well, thanks a lot, Patrick, for this talk. <clears throat> Very nice, especially nice to see that you have a quite decent user study, um, which went some steps be, um, um, behind in, in comparison with, the, with the, um, the other talks which we saw today. So we have here already one initial question. Mm -hmm. um, this looks really great, says, uh, says David Gilbert. Is it possible to try the application somewhere? Um. Yeah, you can write me an email and I um, can send him the app. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to come to mark the work, yeah. Uh, no. will, they, will they actually use, uh, will they require the quest to uh, run the application or can they also do it with a normal Oculus? Um, hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's both possible. So um, I have an um, executable that it's for the Oculus Rift, if, if this is um, what he's meant. Mm -hmm. I have an Android APK for the Quest, of course. Yeah. So there's, by the way, there's a comment from Nigel who just mentioned that the Quest 2 will come out very soon. So there's hope. <laughs> but not in Germany, um, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, so you need to know somebody in USA what to get it, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In France, it's possible to buy it from France. But um, so we don't have to go um, overseas. But um, yeah. We have some data regulation issues here in Germany with Facebook, and that's the reason, or probably that's the reason nobody knows for sure um, um, that we can't buy them. Mm, okay, then we have to get it across the border somehow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's another question from Joanna Bayer. Hmm? Very nice talk. Is she saying, did you also evaluate if the tool actually helps users to learn anatomy? Mm, no, not so far. It was just a usability test and we wanted to know if, if the sense of embodiment idea works and that it works, at least that was what the seven participants showed. And um, now we want to show to medical students as a next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So one last question and remark from Laura Garrison. In addition to the clipping planes and lenses you mentioned to filter structures, did you also consider creating groupings of the muscle structures to help students understand superficial versus deep anatomy. That's a big sticking point in learning this region. Um, no, we haven't considered that, but it sounds interesting. And I was not aware that, that it's um, so important to um, show just parts of the muscles. But um, if I think about it, um, the anatomy atlases show on, also only um, parts of muscles or groups of muscles. So um, yeah, it's, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, how did you create the hand models? This is the last question from Jules Croyer. Um, we downloaded it from the Sketchfab uh, website, but it, um, one hand model had 800,000 uh, 800, um, vertices. And um, with some testing, we found out that the Oculus Quest is able to display um, 400,000 vertices. And we want to show four hands at the same time, so we had to reduce them a lot. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. did this in, in MeshLab with some decimation algorithms and also in Blender. Yeah, to yeah. Get, um, resolution mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thanks a lot for your talk. I have somehow the feeling that we meet again very soon. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> um, uh, okay. <laughs> so Maybe so not. Um, Bernard Prime will, will take over. The last oh, okay, day. okay, yeah. okay. He will take over. Okay. Yeah. According to my list, it was uh, you again. Okay. <laughs> But, but the next one will be Sebastian Wagner, if I see it correctly, right? So see you, bye. So Sebastian Wagner is actually a PhD student. Yeah. Yes, and he will give the talk. So he's also from Magdeburg. And 
of Virusi also in the group of Bernard Prime. So um, he will give a talk on VR, um, acrophobia treatment, development of customizable acrophobia in the inducing scenarios. Patrick, are you? Um, Sebastian, sorry, are, are you able, ready to start? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, great. So, um, thank you very much for your for your kind introduction. Yeah, I just don't um, see your video. I don't know if you want to. I already uh, shared the screen. You can also switch on your. Oh, now I see you. Okay, now it's good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, all, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. So as you already said, um, I will talk about the topic: the aquaphobia treatment, development of customizable aquaphobia inducing scenarios. Um, I will give an, a brief introduction into the topic. So. Around 15% um, of the uh, German adult population is affected by a specific phobia. And uh, yeah, specific phobias are a common type of, of anxiety disorders in which fear and anxiety are caused by specific objects or situations. Um, one of the most uh, common specific phobias um, yeah, is fear of height, but also um, fear of spiders is very common. Um, it is estimated that um, less than 20% of those who, who have, have any kind of anxiety disorders seek any kind of treatment. And the consequences of these phobias are that um, patients uh, try to avoid such situations which cause their fear or anxiety. Um, these behaviors are internalized by these uh, patients and they become second nature and resistant to change. So um, most of the time they are not able to, to overcome these, these um, anxiety uh, on their own. And this can um, have a highly high uh, influence on their everyday life. Um, a common um, yeah, approach um, for this therapy is exposure therapy. Um, exposure therapy is considered to be the most effective treatment for anxiety disorders. Um, and ex um, exposure therapy is an approach where the patient is, uh, patient is repeatedly confronted with their anxiety. And um, yeah, this, this results in a temporary increase in the anxiety during the therapy. But the positive aspect is um, that patients get used to their fear stimulus. This weakens the link between the stimulus and the bad outcomes as the patient, patient realizes that basically no bad outcomes have to be expected. And uh, this results in an increase in the perceived agency um, in the situations. Then we have um, a term called VRET that's um, the possibility to use the exposure therapy in VR. So um, we can, we can um, take the positive aspects of exposure therapy and extend them with uh, the beneficial um, yeah, aspects of VR. Um, we can simulate in VR real world situations. Uh, we can extend these real world situations with elements that would not be feasible in the real world. Um, the, the overall environment is more controllable than in the real world. Um, often it's, it's, yeah, it's less effort to, to, is required for the, for the therapy, and it's often also more, more cost effectively. As, for example, no travel time is, is needed to, to use this system. And additionally, um, yeah, we can also use motivational um, yeah, strategies, elements, um, like gamification elements um, that are known from video games in, this, in these cases. So we created a virtual environment using the game engine uh, Unity. Um, as an HMD, we used the Oculus Rift. And um, yeah, based on discussions with, with two experienced therapists in, in exposure therapy, uh, we created first a tutorial scenario where the user learns how to use VR and, and uh, in, an, in a safe environment, and then created two exposure uh, um, scenarios, which I will introduce in the next two slides. Um, yeah, and, and for, the, for the locomotion and, and the, the, um, the, the interaction, we used the, the controllers of the Oculus Rift. And um, yeah, so we had some, some limitations by the, by the therapist um, in, in the case of the, of the space we have in, the, in these offices. So we used um, the, the, the control via, via um, joystick because it's, yeah, have, have um, really low um, space requirements. So here you can see a screenshot of the, the first environment, the, the bridge scenario. So you can see a couple of, of floating, floating um, platforms, which, which are connected with, with virtual bridges. These bridges have different properties like solid ground, some of railings, um, and also transparent material is used. And uh, you can see these, these letters here, these, these positions um, where we, um, yeah, 
request an, an anxiety report from the, from the patients so we can evaluate um, um, the 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 um, the anxiety level which which arises in in these in these scenario. So our our second scenario is the tower scenario. Um, you can see here these these three parts of the tower. Um, the main task is to scan this tower. Um, um, and at the, in the beginning, the, the ramps are very wide and, and have also have railings, so relatively safe, and they become more and more narrow. And in the last section, um, the material of the tower is made of a transparent material so that the patient can't avoid looking at the surrounding because in, in typical um, yeah, behavior of patients is uh, that they look at the ground to avoid looking around to, to that they not realize how um, how high the platform or the tower actually is where, where they are located at the moment. So then um, we have these uh, anxiety reporting function uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so in specific positions in these, these scenarios, we request an uh, yeah, anxiety evaluation, uh, you can say, um, from an, on a scale from one to nine. Um, this is, that's done by the, by the patient by using the, the left controller. And he just uses the, the, the joystick to, to, to pick a value from, from one to nine. And this allows the, us to, to record these values automatically and then um, can automatically the, an, analyze them afterwards. Then we also included two kinds of motivational elements because in, in, in this such kind of, of therapy, it is um, very important that patients yeah, stay in the therapy over, over a couple of sessions. Um, because most of the time, not only, not only one, one session is required. Um, so we try to integrate these motivational elements to motivate the patient to stay in the, in the therapy. Um, the first element is collectible batches. Um, in the middle and of the, in, in the end of the of two scenarios, there are closed chests with, with a collectible batch inside. And um, they, they serve as a collectible and constant reminder of the therapy progress. So when a user um, reaches one of these closed chests, um, he first will, will open the chest, can, can grab these, uh, these badge with, with the controller and then put it onto the pin board, um, which, which is the, the, the therapy progress information you can say. So after, after the, the first session, in the se second session, he will see, okay, I already achieved um, this badge so that he, he'll get some, some kind of feedback on um, what, what he already achieved. Um, the second um, type of, of motivation element we used is a closing game. Um, there is a term called peak end rule, which was introduced by Kahneman and Tversky. And um, the rule states that how we remember an experience is mainly influenced by two factors. The most extreme experience, like the most painful, or you can also say the, the most fearful in this case, um, and its last moment. So, we designed a, a, a small interaction game where, where the user grabs a stick and pushes some, some boxes of a floating platform. And we want to, to, to give the patient an, yeah, an enjoyable experience in the end of the therapy. So um, to use these, these peak end rule that, he, that it's more likely that he, that he will remain in the, in the therapy and, and uh, yeah. So then we have um, adjustable parameters that can be adjusted by the therapist before the actual therapy session starts. So the therapist can adjust the height of these floating platforms, um, the wind strength, and if there, there should be water on the ground. Um, water can create an additional feeling of insecurity as the, the depth of the water cannot be clearly estimated by the, by the patient. To, to adjust these parameters, the, the therapist can either use a remote control panel or an NVR menu, and we assume that um, in the beginning, when a, when a therapist starts with such a kind of, of um, uh, environment or application, he will, will more use the NVR menu because he can directly see what influence the, the adjustments of the parameters have. And, and later, when he's more experienced with the application, um, we assume that um, the control, uh, remote control panel will be enough to, to set up the, the, the parameters for, for a therapy session. To conclude our, our work, um, we developed a customizable therapy application using gamification strategies to motivate patients. Um, our first evaluations that we haven't stated yet um, showed that uh, 
applications um, that our envi environment induces fear of height. So that's an, an, an requirement um, that our, our application have to do. Um, we plan to evaluate cyber sickness symptoms because of our um, um, interaction method, but it's not, not, not that, that trivial because um, cyber sickness symptoms often overlap with, with anxiety symptoms. Um, so you can't clearly say if it's, if it's an, an cyber sickness symptom or maybe an, uh, an anxiety symptom. Um, if, there, if there are issues um, arising with, with cyber sickness, we, we plan to, to use different um, yeah, locomotion techniques like walking in place. It also needs only, only um, yeah, a bit of space, not too much. So it could be, could be also feasible in the, in the um, therapist's office. So we also plan to, to evaluate the, the effect of our motivational elements, if it helps to, to um, yeah, motivate the patients and that they stay in the therapy. And in the end, um, we also want to integrate more customization options into our um, environment, like just adjustable width of the ramps, the distance between the bridges or the available of, um, availability of railings, so that the therapist has more, more possibilities to um, personalize the, the environment for the, for the patients. So yeah, I would thank you for your for your um, attention, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sebastian. Very interesting topic. I would like to try it on my own. Um, your new, uh, your quite new environment. So there are a couple of questions indeed coming in. So I start with the first one from Michael Krone. Do you think that um, the users were influenced by the appearance of the environment, which has a real world look, but is not rendered with a high degree of photorealism? Mm, yeah, that's 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 a good question. Um, I mean, there there is uh, in the in the first uh, you you saw these these floating platforms. I mean, that's that's. I think every every user will will see. Okay, it's not uh, super realistic. So I think it's also okay when the when the environment is not uh, photorealistically. So. Um, yeah, I mean, you can also um, adjust. At the moment, you can't see your own body. So it could also be an, an, an possibility to, to um, integrate something like that because it will also help to, to um, yeah, feel more present in uh, the, the patient um, feels more in the, in, the, in the actual environment. So I think it, yeah, both, both um, could, be, could, be, um, could be possible that um, it could help more to, to um, make the realism much, much higher, but it could also um, interfere with, with the thing that our virtual environment is not uh, physically um, realistic because we have some, some uh, platforms that are just flying around. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But I have to say from our experience, it's, it's, so we had some, some bird-based, very simple visualizations and simulations, which we did some time ago with, with um, Harald Reiter and um, Falk Schreiber and a couple of colleagues. So basically what we found out um, you always need a reference point and this is what would be a short question to you. So I think then if I see it correctly in your scenarios, you always see the hand, right? So you yeah. see always a 3D hand. So it's, mm -hmm. that's, it's- That's basically on the controller. So yeah. the controllers are the, the tracking devices in this case. Yeah, so, so you have always a reference point, I think, mm -hmm. which yeah. is quite a, a big difference. I think you, mm -hmm. I don't know if you did any test without reference point because for some uh, people, it might be really a problem if you don't have any reference point at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there are many other questions coming in. Or um, let's um, let's continue with Noeska Smith. Nice work for tools for medical diagnosis. It is quite difficult for most researchers to obtain certification of clinical use. How is this for virtual reality therapy tools like this? It's a sorry, it's a complex question, but I yeah. Know I um, so so we're actually not in the in the state that we try to to uh, get any any certification for for actual clinical use. Um, we, we are actually planning an, an, an yeah, first evaluation with patients. So therefore you need an, an uh, ethics um, approval mm -hmm. and something like that. So we are in a relatively early stage. Um, our first tests were not with, with real acrophobia patients. We, we tested with some colleagues and, and some friends, but some of them had um, yeah, some, showed some, some um, or, or told us that they have some problems with, um, with height but they are not actually in, in therapy or something like that, or have not so much issues that they need any kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but they had, um, yeah, that, that's the, the, the actual state we have at the moment. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Sebastian, thanks a lot. So it's very interesting. So I really yeah. uh, Thank you. think you should continue this topic. Um, in terms of time, we just have five minutes. We are five minutes over, so we have to continue. Mm -hmm. So right. thank you very please, much. Have, please have a look to the questions in, in Discord. There are still at least three more questions. In, uh, All right. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> so the, the next talk will be indeed um, from Professor uh, Bernard Prime. He will take over now from uh, Patrick Saalfeld, the presentation. And um, I think that most of the last four presentations are maybe directly from his group. Maybe you can say a few words on this, but his talk will be on student and teacher meet in a shared virtual reality, a one-on-one -on -one tutoring system for anatomy ed education. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. you can hear okay, yeah, indeed, that is primarily Patrick's work. It's based on the master thesis of Anna Schmeier and um, together with the anatomists Wolfgang de Hannes and Hermann Josef Rutkötter. It's a kind of collaborative virtual reality, what we present here. Um, and um, it is indeed a kind of uh, collaborative we are where the teacher and the student meet and they have different um, yeah, hardware setups. There are many methods to teach anatomy. Anatomy atlases and textbooks are classic um, and also um, cadaver dissection as you see here. This is a quite innovative example. So this cadaver was scanned with a CT device and she explains here the relation between what you see um, on the cadaver and how it would look like in cross-sectional anatomy. Yeah. So this uh, brings me to the idea that there are of course a lot of computer-based systems. Meanwhile, interactive 3D visualizations for anatomy educations. Um, Patek and I provided a survey two years before where this is summarized and where we also found the first VR systems for anatomy education. Um, and we are is quite promising here. Um, it's motivating and engaging, allows to focus um, the student really on the three-dimensional models. Um, it's a kind of active learning, which is also very beneficial for learning, but it has also some disadvantages. Um, students may waste some time by following paths that are not very productive. And of course, they may easily miss something that would be important. So we thought an ideal way of learning could be to combine this free exploration as we are allows it um, with guidance from a teacher. And that led to the idea of um, yeah, designing a one on one uh, tutoring system where a teacher gives instructions, provides annotations um, and may intervene if some um, paths are followed that are not very um, successful um, and guidance. That's why I emphasized it here is the, the major um, idea. The requirements that the teacher has and that the student has are quite different. And therefore um, we decided um, already at the beginning to choose an asymmetric setting. That means um, there is different hardware and also different interaction techniques for the teacher and for the student. There are other examples that this may work. So we cite here a French group, for example, that also provided asymmetric collaboration in VR. Of course, a network connection is necessary to, to synchronize um, the interaction, um, but then this can be done in this asymmetric way. We discussed the education scenario, of course, quite carefully with um, our anatomy partners. Um, they emphasized um, the importance of the human skull base and recommended us to focus on this area. Um, and um, more in detail, it's necessary for the students to learn about anatomical structures in this area, um, about their names, their location and their function. And one thing that may be particularly important are these holes, foramina, in the skull base um, where certain vascular structures and nerves pass through so that, for example, has to be learned by the students. The student should be immersed as much as possible and therefore um, should use a VR headset. And as often in this session, uh, it's um, an HTC Vive. I just want to comment it once more. It is, I think, a good trade-off um, between a device that's, that's affordable and on the other hand has a quite good spatial resolution, refresh rate, um, quite good um, horizontal field of view. Um, and a tracking space of five times five meters, that's all beneficial for our kind of, of application. Yeah, the teacher who should navigate the student um, should have access, of course, 
uh, to the learning material that the student sees. Uh, immersion is by far not so important for her. Um, so therefore, uh, we choose a semi-immersive um, device. That's the Z-space in our case. Um, so the user wears glasses, and he can be tracked by the glasses. Um, he has a stylus for, for interaction. Um, that's the setup we choose for the teacher. To go a bit more in detail on the requirements for the student, um, we aim at undergraduate students enrolled at a medical faculty, um, want to provide an immersive setup for this target group. Um, and we have, of course, one requirement that is not so easy to fulfill, namely to connect the 3D models with the symbolic domain. That means with the labels, the textual names, um, it's obviously that um, there is a certain risk to break the immersion if you display labels inside the 3D models that's somehow artificial. Um, so we had to think about this. Um, an easy navigation should be um, supported without severe disorientation problems, but also without um, a high risk for getting cyber sickness, which of course may happen in, in a VR environment. And uh, one um, requirement turned out to be important, namely that the students are able to inspect individual anatomical structures. Why? Um, small anatomical structures may be occluded even from very different viewing directions. So to, to understand their shape, it's really beneficial that you are um, enabled to select one of these structures, take it out of the models or get a copy, um, which you can take out, rotate it and inspect it. Yeah, how the system is actually realized. Um, we provided an oversized mod, um, skull model. So it's in fact oversized by almost a factor of 100. So you are very small and you are inside this very large skull um, where you can walk and fly um, and see interesting structures. Um, how is the interaction accomplished? Um, of course, the VR controllers are used for this, and, and there are two of them. Um, you have a dominant hand. Most people have the right hand as the dominant hand and a non-dominant hand. Um, and the typical division of labor then is that you use the controller in the non-dominant hand um, for interactions that require a lower amount of precision. So here you basically choose um, among three modes, the handbook mode, the navigation mode, and the inspection mode. In the handbook mode, um, for example, you just see information about selected structure. The navigation mode allows you to jump to a landmark. And the inspection mode allows you to select with the other hand and the other controller um, an object and get a copy, which you can explore in more detail. Yeah? This explains here the interaction that is carried out with the controller in the dominant hand. Um, this creation of a ghost copy was already introduced 20 years before by, by Tan and colleagues. So that's what we integrate here as well. Um, and as navigation modes or locomotion techniques, as others would say, um, we provide teleportation, flying, and physical walking. Teleportation, of course, is involved with um, orientation problems. Um, but on the other hand, um, it has the advantage that um, cyber sickness can not occur. So we speculate that it is beneficial to provide three choices here because not one navigation mode um, would be the best for, for all the students. Um, here you see um, that the user can be teleported to a point close to a wall, not too close to the wall. Yeah, otherwise, you cannot um, see so much um, and you select this point via um, ray casting. Here is a short video that shows this inspection. Yeah, you get an impression of how small the user is and how large these uh, structures are in comparison. Yeah, they can be freely rotated. Um, that is one of the major interactions for the student. Um, Patrick, wie komme ich denn weiter zum nächsten Video? Ja, teacher. Require, yeah, now we come to the teacher system. Um, so we have, um, of course, requirements there as well. The medical student should be um, supported, annotations uh, should be provided, and um, the teacher can see where the student is. He has a kind of overview position. 
um, the student is represented as an avatar, which you see here, this small, very abstract, gender neutral, uh, yellow person is the, the avatar. Um, and as already mentioned, um, the major uh, device is the Z space. So the student uses this combination of a stereoscopic display with head tracking, which is often summarized as fish tank we are. And um, she has available this stylus with six degrees of freedom. These three buttons here, which allow, for example, to rotate the structure. It turns out that this interaction is really sufficient for the purpose of the teacher. Um, yeah, the teacher is able to specify landmarks, set landmarks where the user should navigate to um, with one of the navigation modes that I briefly mentioned. Um, and um, the teacher can also create labels, labels that are associated always with a surface. The label is placed um, in such a way that it can be um, read very well, that legibility is improved. Um, we basically follow an approach by Sebastian Pick and, and colleagues, uh, how to integrate um, labels in VR. And yeah, one more thing that is um, integrated here that is um, always integrated if, if Patrick is involved, he uh, deals a lot with sketching um, and for good reasons, because for um, educational purposes, it is quite useful if a teacher can sketch something, draw something on a surface, highlight areas, for example. So there are some um, interactions necessary to enable um, sketching, namely the teacher can select a color um, and also the thickness um, of this mark that, that actually arises. In this short video, you see the teacher with the Z space um, interacting. Um, the teacher sees what uh, the student is doing and where he is. That is exactly the student view here. Yeah, so that is the way how the teacher system is realized. And finally, I have to show the, the combined system, the shared virtual environment, as mentioned, um, both are connected via a network here, the, the teacher, and here the student. By the way, here you see one of these foramina, which are so important. Um, and also the structures are mentioned that pass through this um, hole in the, in the sky. Yeah, you get an impression of this once more. Yeah, let me summarize and conclude. Um, we presented a we are one-on-one -on -one tutoring system for anatomy education, a guided way of teaching. Um, shared virtual environment. Um, if you ask about limitations, um, of course, a one-on-one -on -one tutoring system is a very expensive type of, of teaching. Yeah, you would need a high number of educators to do this on a, on a broader scale. And that leads, of course, to one idea to extend this, namely to uh, enable the teacher to supervise uh, not only one student, but a couple of students. And for this, again, a number of decisions would be necessary. These and the decisions we already taken would um, need to be evaluated in a, in a formal analysis. Yeah, in Corona times, that was all a bit difficult, um, but, but in the future, we hope that this would be possible. Yeah, before I thank you for your attention, just a quick look on the references that were used for this talk. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bernard. Mm -hmm. Very interesting talk, and especially people who know me know that I'm a big fan of the Z space. Yeah. Um, I basically, when I did my postdoc in Monash University 2015 16, I spent half a year inside the Z space 200, and you actually can do it without going crazy because it's semi immersive virtual reality. So yeah. it works quite good. So, um, um, maybe a question regarding your experience with the Z space. So, people who were using the Z space, did they have problems by, by using? the 3D pen, the uh, Z-Space stylus pen, and interacting with the um, virtual reality visualizations, or did this work quite well? I have not so much evidence to, to answer this question. My mm -hmm. own experience, and I'm not very technology uh, effing, um, is, is very positive. I like this really a lot. I always have the impression that I can quite precisely control this pen and um, really can initiate the interactions that, that I want to do. Um, from my PhD students, I always had the same impressions. Uh, they wanted to have this device is something that I remember from one of the early uh, VIS conferences. I think it was in 2011 when we decided to, to buy this. Um, mm. But I have not so much evidence about the, the real target user group. Mm. Yeah, I have to say we did a couple of, we use it for many demos. And if you design it in a way that it's 
quite simple interaction it works quite well yeah, yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. also regarding i really liked the interaction which were implemented here and said you have this different coloring schemes in the context mm -hmm. of this so let me have a look if there are more questions coming up so may maybe a question to you because it, it was a quite complex one from before so basically i think um i want to repeat this question from Neska smith Mm -hmm. um, for tools for medical diagnosis, it, it is quite uh, difficult for most researchers to obtain certification for clinical use. Did you look into this already? Because you have now a number, it, it was four projects which are going, or let's say three projects which are going into this direction. Did you look into this to get a certification? Um, no, actually not. Nuska is perfectly right. That is a complex uh, process. And of mm -hmm. course, at the end, someone has to take this extra mile because otherwise all our research ends up in, in not being used in practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it's um, a very challenging process. And within the scope of a PhD thesis, for example, it typically cannot be realized. In what I presented here, that is a teaching system and also what Patrick presented before. There, it is really not necessary. Yeah. Um, but of course, for, for what Sebastian has presented, um, it would be definitely necessary. Um, and for what Ben has presented, this VR flow lens, that first needs much more adaptation to a particular application. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then it's really worth to think about in an industry core. It can only work in an industry com uh, co combination. Yeah, um, That a university partner is doing this alone probably is, is not successful. Yeah, for sure. It will be just much too expensive here. Yeah. May, I think he has one more question. Um, I, I think it's more remark. It's from Corrado Kelly. I liked it a lot. I teach anatomy and this support would be really cool. I know a lab in Palermo who is working on workstations for students based on Z-Space. Yeah, actually the Z-Space um, has a number of um, applications i think already which are going into this direction but they are not so much science-based it's more for educative approaches yeah. mm -hmm. so um with this i think we are at the end i, I was told i can um uh, so five minutes are okay but now we are seven minutes over time so i think we have to close the session so thanks a lot bernard for this very yeah, nice thank talk. You. And thanks a lot to all the speakers i think it was very exciting it was a number of very exciting talks uh, today and if you have questions please go back just to discord and um, you can bombard the, the authors with more questions so thanks a lot for joining the questions uh, today and hope to see you soon again thank you bye bye